I think that uh, the most meaningful uh, thing for me has been the personal relationship with other soldiers under stress. And being a member of that tribe is uh, special in my experience. I was born and raised in South Dakota on the 19th of January in 1940. When I graduated from high school, I did go to the University of South Dakota for two years, and I decided that I should maybe uh, take a break, and I enlisted in the Army. I enlisted at Christmas time, 1962, airborne unassigned, which meant I'd be an infantry soldier in a paratroop outfit. And I served three years at Fort Campbell, Kentucky in the 101st Airborne Division. By the time the three years was up, I'd been promoted. I was a young sergeant and I was ready to go back to the university. And the second year that I was back, I uh, went over to the ROTC department and I told them that I was a prior service guy, that the Vietnam War was on and that I was interested in doing that and uh, was commissioned in the summer of 1966. Uh, I was assigned back to the 101st at Fort Campbell, Kentucky, and I uh, volunteered for Vietnam. And so off I went to the Ranger School and then to Vietnam as a rifle platoon leader in a parachute infantry uh, battalion. I uh, arrived in June of 1967 and there I was, the platoon leader of the 3rd Platoon, C Company, 2nd 327, 1st Brigade, 101st Airborne Division. We took a lot of casualties. We had a lot of men hurt and a lot of men killed. And it was because uh, our purpose was to uh, locate the enemy. I joined him in June and uh, we were in a uh, pretty good fight uh, in November. The platoon uh, was uh, fairly small, 23 or 24 men, rather than the 44 that we were supposed to have. We were walking parallel, about 100 yards apart, when uh, we both walked into North Vietnamese. It was a big unit. Uh, we were able to get together. Uh, the fight uh, went on uh, overnight, and another platoon from the company was able to join us, and uh, together we formed a perimeter and we fought off uh, the enemy. Uh, there were a lot of North Vietnamese in and around the position that had been killed. A number of the uh, platoon had been killed and uh, a larger number had been wounded. And because I'd been wounded, I climbed in uh, with them and I went out uh, on that last uh, helicopter lift. I uh, had taken some shrapnel. Uh, one piece uh, went through my left eye, came out the roof of my mouth and the eye had uh, gone blind. A couple of other pieces uh, hit me uh, in the legs and I had a pretty good sized chunk that uh, went through my neck. And I thought that uh, that was it. And it really, uh, it really angered me, to tell you the truth, because uh, I thought it was damned unfair. I hadn't completed my mission. And the result of it was that uh, I roamed around and uh, sought out some uh, enemy who had gotten pretty close to us, uh, settling accounts. That action on uh, 11 November 1967 resulted in uh, being medevac for a couple of weeks, but I was back with the unit and back in the company, certainly by the 1st of December. Vietnam. United States helicopter gunships backed up ground forces in a strong assault on a Viet Cong position only three miles from Saigon's Tan Son Nuc Air Base. And of course, uh, Tet occurred in February 1968. Uh, my unit was in the field, uh, then down on the Cambodian border. Uh, we were picked up by helicopter and flown to a uh, airstrip, uh, loaded into C-130 uh, aircraft and flown to Tan Sanut, the big airport in Saigon. And so we went into action right then 
And we were in the uh, Saigon environs for, must have been a week or 10 days, something like that. We uh, were again loaded in C-130s and we flew up to a place called Fubai, maybe 10 miles south of the old imperial capital of Wei. And the battle continued there. Uh, that took us up to the summer of uh, 1968, which pretty well completed my first year in Vietnam. My second year was uh, split. I was partially uh, on a staff and uh, partially working for the uh, division uh, intelligence uh, staff. When the uh, second year was up, I was shipped back to the United States and I was assigned to Fort Benning, Georgia. And so I was there for 18 months training paratroopers before I volunteered to return to Vietnam. The first of 1971, I was back in Vietnam and back in the 101st. One of the jobs I had in the Airborne Department at Fort Benning, Georgia, was uh, running the Army's Pathfinder course. And when I went back to Vietnam, I was assigned as the Pathfinder platoon leader of the uh, 101st Airborne Division. I commanded that Pathfinder unit for six months and then went back to the field as a paratroop uh, rifle company commander for six months, which was the latter part of 1971. Vietnamization was the term that the Nixon administration used uh, for uh, shifting the war to the Vietnamese and uh, pulling the United States out of the Vietnam War. The American War was over, but the uh, war in Vietnam was certainly not over, and everybody knew that. And I wasn't ready uh, to come back and I served another tour with a Vietnamese paratroop battalion, first of 1972. Vietnamization, leaving the South Vietnamese to it, is being tested most dramatically here on Highway 13, 40 miles north of Saigon, where 20,000 South Vietnamese troops are now pinned down whilst trying to lift the siege of An Loc 10 miles up the road. We got a phone call saying that the North Vietnamese had invaded across the, the demilitarized zone up in the north. The uh, president of Vietnam uh, kind of decided uh, where the, the biggest hole was that needed to be plugged and uh, decided that that was a provincial capital called An Loc. Much of the fighting centers around the town of An Loc on Highway 13, only 50 miles from Saigon. We got to the point where the lead battalion was in a uh, big fight and was in the process of getting overrun. And to overrun a parachute infantry battalion would require a lot of North Vietnamese, and there were a lot of them. In fact, there was about a division of them, uh, maybe uh, five to 6,000 of them. And the next day, we loaded in helicopters and did a combat assault right into An Loc. On the third day, uh, we were under uh, serious attack and we're in the process of being overrun as well. And the battalion commander uh, was ordered to move to uh, a different spot, but he left one rifle company to cover the uh, movement of the rest of the battalion. I said to him that I had uh, airstrikes and I had uh, several of them stacked up and that I was gonna stay with that company. He uh, grabbed me by my uh, web gear and pulled me close. And he said, uh, Mike, uh, do not stay here very long. 5-1 Company, which is the company he was leaving behind, he said, today, 5-1 Company will die. And everybody <clears throat> went up there wearing steel helmets. These guys had thrown off their steel helmets, and they had pulled out their, their maroon paratroop berets. They had decided that they were going to die there, but they were going to die as uh, identified as uh, paratroopers. And I had a, a man with me carrying my radio. I grabbed him, gave him a shake. I said, it's time to go. He didn't move. He'd been killed. He'd been shot in the head, laying right beside me. I pulled the uh, radio out of his rucksack. I was carrying that radio by its little uh, steel handle. And I got up and I ran uh, about 100 yards or so. The shooting uh, had increased back in that uh, position. 
there was a crescendo of uh, shooting going on, and then it began to taper off, which meant that those guys had been overrun and the North Vietnamese were in there with them. And so I put the next airstrike right in there on top of them. We went up there with about 550 men in the battalion. Uh, there might have been 150 unwounded soldiers left in the battalion. And we might have had uh, 50, 60 wounded, walking wounded who were still fighting. Everyone else had been killed. The South Vietnamese Army uh, held An Luc against an overwhelming uh, North Vietnamese uh, effort. True faith and allegiance, this is the story of an American paratrooper serving with a Vietnamese parachute infantry battalion. Serving with the Vietnamese 5th Airborne Battalion was my fourth tour in Vietnam. It was in June of 1972 and I had orders to return to the United States and landed at Travis Air Force Base and flew back to South Dakota. Orders are in the mail. You're gonna get them in a week or so and you're being assigned to Fort Knox, Kentucky and was in graduate school for a couple of years. The Army then sent me to the Army Staff College at Fort uh, Leavenworth, Kansas for another year, and then I stayed on and taught there for a couple of years. And then I was told that I was going to go to Australia for a year to attend the Australian Army Staff College, then came back to the States and was assigned to Fort Riley, Kansas, and uh, was on a staff for about uh, nine months and then commanded an infantry battalion at Fort Riley for almost three years. And I went to work for the Defense Intelligence Agency, DIA. I went to Manila for two years, and then to Singapore for three years, and then up to Malaysia uh, for a total of five years. And after 32 years of active federal service, I retired as a colonel of infantry the end of August, 1st of September, of 1995. I'm an American patriot and I liked the Army and I liked the men that I had served with and I liked the military lifestyle. The first uh, Distinguished Service Cross that I received was the result of that action on the 11th of November 1967. And in the second case, it was uh, received a Distinguished Service Cross, the result of the uh, fight in uh, Anlock in 1972 when I was serving with the Vietnamese uh, Parachute Infantry Battalion. Being a member of that tribe, it's probably the most uh, important uh, membership that, uh, that I have. And you see, it has absolutely nothing to do with, you see, it has nothing to do with race, uh, nothing to do with, uh, with ethnicity or with uh, religious belief. It only centers on those who were together uh, in combat. It gave me a lifelong gift of uh, perspective, no matter how bad things get. Right there next to him. And I went on later to watch my wife tragically die a day by day of cancer. And combat experience gave me an inner strength and a perspective um, that I can deal with anything that life gives me. Well, I was born in New Jersey in uh, 1962 uh, as a third generation uh, soldier. Then I graduated high school, went off to college, and went to Seton Hall University on an Army ROTC scholarship, and I graduated uh, college in 1984. 
My father was career military. Um, he was a full-time National Guard officer, and he was also an executive in the State Department of Defense for New Jersey. As I got older, I started accepting the reality that, that my family serves in the military. The expectation was just one tour, and after about a year and a half on active duty, I actually fell in love with the Army, and it became my entire life. Upon graduation of college and commissioning, I was sent to the Armor Officer Basic Course at Fort Knox, Kentucky in 1985. And I was trained uh, to command uh, M1 Abrams tanks. So I was a pretty much a straight tank guy. My first duty, tour of duty after school, I was, uh, I was kept at Fort Knox and I became a training officer for uh, M1A1 basic training and AIT it was called at the time. So I served at Fort Knox uh, for my first uh, four years and then uh, got my first uh, operational assignment uh, in the 3rd Armored Division, the Spearhead Division in Friedberg, Germany. And, uh, and that was the, kind of the end of the Cold War and from there is when Operation Desert Shield and Desert Storm started. At my direction, elements of the 82nd Airborne Division as well as key units of the United States Air Force are arriving today to take up defensive positions in Saudi Arabia. And then I was uh, deployed to fight in the Gulf War from Germany in uh, January of 1990. After having spent several years in command of tank companies up on the West German, East German border, uh, waiting for, uh, for, that, for that war that never happened. We seek the immediate, unconditional, and complete withdrawal of all Iraqi forces from Kuwait. We were the last uh, European force to deploy to the Middle East that fought in Desert Storm. And then, so we were sort of late. We never got our chance to have our tanks painted sand. We fought with green tanks. Um, and then they gave us some five gallon uh, tan paint cans. And we actually kind of huck finned with brushes and painted our tanks and they looked terrible. Never trained to be a desert fighter. Was very, very, very skilled and competent uh, in Europe, uh, up on the border between uh, West and East Germany. And so it was, there was a lot of discovery learning to prepare myself, my unit, uh, deploy and, and fight in the Middle East. I arrived on January 3rd um, and then the air campaign started about a month later. I commanded 114 men, 14 Abrams tanks, and uh, I command my tank, so I am in the position, the crew position, as the tank commander, but I'm also the commander of the entire unit. And I'm on the battlefield, literally um, 50, 60 feet away from my lead tank going into combat. So it's, it's leading from the front uh, as, as a combat arms officer. We were uh, directly involved in the ground, the ground attack. We were part of the U.S. Army 7th Corps, which was the main effort, the big right, famous big right hook that went from Saudi Arabia north into Iraq and then a uh, hard east all the way into and fighting through the uh, Republican Guard Force, three different elements of divisions of the Republican Guard Forces, which was the main element of the Iraqi army at the time and fought all the way into and just outside of Kuwait City at the time of the ceasefire. Um, it was about a five and a half or six days of, of on and off combat. We captured about 300 some soldiers and destroyed 54 vehicles. Uh, so it was very successful, very fast paced. Um, it was the most defining experience of my, of my life thus far. We were very successful and we did most of our engagements in the, e in the night. And the Iraqis we were opposing did not have the, the night vision capability that we had or the range of their weapon systems. So I quickly discovered that this was not a fair fight. And I had read a book about the psychology of war and that I knew that I was also responsible, not just the physical lives of my soldiers, but the psychological lives of my soldiers. So uh, w when I discovered that we had a, an overmatch and an advantage on our enemy, that I was willing to take operational risk to uh, give the enemy more time to organize themselves, to, to, to surrender. We would fire machine gun fire in front of them, intentionally not at them. 
to see if they'd get, encourage them to give up. I, I gave them every chance to give up more humanistically for my soldiers, not necessarily concerned about them. The thing I learned most uh, is, is the humanity of war. There is, there is a humanity on the battlefield. Six members of my, myself and, and uh, five other members of my, uh, my unit were awarded the Bronze Star Medal for our combat action in Operation Desert Shield, Desert Storm. My career after Desert Storm um, was somewhat atypical. I went out to the National Training Center in Mojave Desert and was a combat trainer for several years. From that, I went on to Fort Knox. I was a special assistant to the commanding general, and the Army started developing digital uh, communications and command and control platforms and, and embedding them onto combat vehicles. Um, so I served as a special assistant for war, war fighting to the Chief of Armor and Cavalry and I got involved in, in big uh, war games in the Pentagon. Um, it was called uh, Force 21. It was developing the Army to transition to the 21st century, and I got to play a lead role in all of that work, and that kind of defined most of my, most of my, rest of my career. My last operational assignment as a major, I went stationed at Fort Riley from uh, 1997 to 2000. Back to a tank battalion, I was a tank operations officer, executive officer, a brigade operations officer, and uh, that's when my wife, who has been dealing with cancer for our entire career, um, was uh, diagnosed as terminally ill, and that profoundly changed the, uh, the trajectory of my military career. In 1987, uh, I married Paula. I met her at uh, Fort Knox during my first assignment, and she stayed with me to her death uh, 14 years in, in military. She was a great Army wife. We had our first child uh, on our first assignment at Fort Knox, Kentucky, uh, with my oldest daughter, Taylor. Shortly right after that, my wife was diagnosed with cancer and uh, had to have some treatment that would prevent us from having another child. But so the blessing was I came home from war. She was cleared medically. And while stationed at Fort Irwin, California, um, um, we had Elizabeth, my second daughter. I, uh, I made lieutenant colonel, and I was selected as one of the top uh, candidates to command a, a tank battalion, which was my career goal, and I, dec I declined it so I could take care of my, my family. So the Army allowed me to go to Kansas State University and run the Army ROTC program while still living at Fort Riley. It was hard because I had sacrificed so much, my wife had sacrificed so much, we never let her disease ever slow down our our military lives. We did everything. We never took an easy assignment, and, and, and so she, she deserves every medal that I have. And my daughters were 8 and 11 when their mother passed in uh, 2000. And uh, it has been the, the singular achievement of my life is, is to become a good father. We really were pledged to make sure our girls got a college education. Uh, it's something she didn't have an opportunity to do. I was the first generation in my family to have that. And so I was with my daughters. I was working at the university that they were attending as students. And in fact, I went back and got my second master's degree and my doctorate. So most of the time they were in college, all three of us were Kansas State University students. So my legacy assignment, my last assignment, was uh, I ran the Army uh, ROTC program as the professor of military science at Kansas State University. When I took over the program at Kansas State, it was somewhat of the bad news bears, and it took me three years with the help of, my, of a great staff and cadre and the university and Fort Riley, and, and we rebuilt the program, and it became, at the time, they called it a national flagship program. In 2006, um, I announced my retirement. So at the end of my ROTC assignment, I would have concluded 22 years of active federal military service as an, as an armor officer. When the president, John Weefold, was making his remarks at my military retirement, his last remark was, and Art's gonna come work for me starting Monday. And that was the first I knew of it. 
and it actually happened that way. Uh, I overnight became a uh, somewhat senior executive administrator at a major public research university, and that transition became uh, an enduring aspiration of mine to serve veterans' transitions, not just my own. President Weefald, um, close to the end of his tenure, um, General Myers, a distinguished military graduate of Kansas State University, was retiring as the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. And uh, he was uh, appointed as a foundational professor of military history and leadership. And then you fast forward when Kirk Schultz um, left Kansas State University for another assignment, the Board of Regents appointed him and he was willing to do it to become our permanent president. So I've been working for General Myers uh, as the former chairman of Joint Chiefs of Staff and most recently now, I've worked with the governor and her task force on the prevention of veteran suicide. So I'm really getting a chance now to do big, big, serious things that are really starting to make a significant impact positively on the life course of our military veterans. I think one of the most fortunate things that I had during my military career uh, was uh, the presence of a, a very, very, very dear uh, mentor. I had almost continuous coverage of, of, of an amazing mentor, and I, and I keep their pictures uh, on my wall, um, and I think of them always. To serve my country in uniform was, first and foremost, a responsible, an awesome responsibility. I, I never took a minute of it or a day of it as a benefit, or it, it was absolutely a responsibility, a sacred responsibility. There is a cost of service. I mean, I, I've had amazing opportunities, and I've embraced them all, and I gave my, my level best, I gave everything ever assigned to me. I owed nothing less than the best performance and preparing myself every day to fulfill that responsibility.